welcome to the SaaS Revolution show, uh, Hui Brandao, uh, CEO and founder of Zen Club. Welcome, Hui. Hi, Alex. Thank you for having me. No, uh, great to have you on. Is it, uh, did I get the pronunciation right? Was it Rui or Hui? Uh, or was it with the silent kind of R there? <laughs> Both of them are right. Hui Both is how we, we pronounce it. <laughs> okay. And, and uh, can you tell our sort of listeners where you are, where you're calling from? Uh, I'm based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I'm Portuguese. I've been living here for, for eight years. Uh, I'm a medical doctor, so <laughs> uh, I came here as a medical student when I was 21 to do mm -hmm. my last year of med school and loved the vibe, loved the amount of opportunities Brazil has to offer, uh, the way people live their day to day. And uh, eight years, of <laughs> I came here for nine months and eight years have gone and I'm still here. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I went to Sao Paulo the first time, I think a couple of years ago, uh, really took me by surprise. Uh, I mean, obviously, I've been to Brazil many times. In fact, I even lived there uh, for a year uh, once oh. after I finished uh, university but in, in, uh, in Rio. Um, but um, but yeah, like love the way of life uh, in, uh, in in Brazil, the weather and uh, many things. Uh, many things. <laughs> Great, yeah. I bet, I bet. <laughs> You pick, yeah, you pick well. You're the first doctor that we've had on the, the podcast. But um, like, so uh, why don't we start there? I mean, in terms of like, to tell us a little bit more uh, about your, yourself. You mentioned you're Portuguese. You mentioned the doctor. You moved to Brazil uh, eight years ago. Um, any more insights into who you are um, as a person and then why you founded uh, Zen Club and what that is? Absolutely. So um, I started med school because I really loved the, the space, but I wasn't really sure I wanted to be a medical doctor for the rest of my life because I, w I, I couldn't conceive the idea of not scaling past the 24 hours a day I have. Uh, so it's immediate gratification, really like uh, human gratification, right, on a day to day basis. Also a lot of suffering. Um, but so decided to stay in Brazil after finishing med school because I saw there was a lot of opportunity. Like, unlike Europe, where there's a lot of rules when you're a student, when there's a lot of rules when you're starting up, Brazil, they need all the manpower they, they can have, right? So first day, first week of, of, of school here, and I was in the ER, like, doing surgery. I, I, did, I did a birth. So, <laughs> uh, so I, it was really like eye-opening how, how if you have the right attitude and if you really roll up your sleeves, you can get into action, right? But then that, that's the pro of Brazil in my view. Uh, then there's a cons, which is the bureaucracy. So I think a lot of people love it. A lot of people, when they come here, they are surprised because all they hear abroad is like insecurity, blah, blah, blah. But the second thing they hear is the bureaucracy. And so as a medical doctor here as well, I wasn't able to work because no hospital would sponsor me a visa. So they were only used to sponsoring Mercosul, so Argentinians, and, and I guess there's not a lot of uh, search for, from US or European doctors. Uh, so at that time, and, and going back to my view of, I, I don't think it's the people in healthcare that really need to ramp up, like nurses, doctors. I think it's the system. So I used that as an opportunity to do an MBA here in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. And at the same time, I did the board exams uh, for the residency in the US. So throughout that year, I learned a lot of business and I also uh, got my board exams in the US. Um, went to the US, went to New York um, to work at, uh, in Manhattan. I was gonna start my residency in vascular surgery. Um, and at that time, my mom had a burnout uh, that, that deteriorated into a psychotic burst. And, and, and so for a couple of months, it was a very intense uh, uh, period for me, for her, for, for our family. And that really showed me uh, that you have hospitals and healthcare plans where people use them for physical illness. People have... Uh, fitness studios, class pass, gym pass for, for physical health, if you want to explore your physical health side. But you have no brand, you have no reference whatsoever. You don't have an emotional health system. So uh, clearly my mom didn't burst out of anywhere. Like it was a compound effect over time. So my little sister, we're three, 
just uh, was about to leave home. And that's when everything came to, came to, to really burst. Um, so you're looking at a 55 year old woman, very well in her career, looking at how my retirement, how the next 40 years are gonna be. I'm not ready for this. Oh, my youngest daughter is leaving the house. And we were like, come on, mom, just deal with it, just deal with it. And then once it happened, um, we also didn't know where to look. I'm a doctor, my brother is a doctor. Like, we had no clue where to, what therapist should we go to, what psychiatrist do we need to go to. And, and with all of those problems I faced, um, I, I really looked at, at emotional health and I was like, this is it. Like, I, I was always thinking about health system, health system, but um, it's too it's too complicated to navigate within and i saw like this is something i really need to help other people do so i came back to brazil um met my co-founder which was the the cto and cpo of a huge e-commerce also portuguese uh living here <laughs> the portuguese mafia and it was interesting because we were on two different journeys but they 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 had a a, a middle ground so i was like on the minus 100 uh, where there's mental illness and, and searching of how can I bring people in minus 100 to zero. And he was at zero. So in a very like growth company, good salary, good pay, like everything, but wanted more. So he was at zero and he wanted to get to 100. Um, and so, yep, yeah, I had two months in Brazil due to the, the American visas I needed to renew. Uh, we just like we met over lunch, introduced by by my best friend, uh, who's an entrepreneur, uh, a successful entrepreneur himself, and we were like, okay, uh, what if? Do you think people will uh, do uh, video consultations uh, with therapists and coaches uh, from day zero? So will they pay their first session online, not knowing personally that that person? And, and the second hypothesis we needed to, to, to prove was, will they come back for a second one? Uh, and so we put a WordPress website on. Uh, I had coffee with like 100 therapists over a month, uh, got a network of 30 of them. And yeah, we put a website where people could uh, search uh, for what they were feeling. So I'm anxious, I want personal improvements, I'm depressed. Here are the top five, 10 specialists we have on our network. You can see their photo, their CV, and very, in a very summarized way, uh, you, their, their schedules. Uh, you can pay and do the session online. And yeah, that was 2016, so four years ago. Uh, and we're like, okay, there's something here. Uh, I never went back to the US. I quit residency there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, here, I, here we are four years later. Awesome. Great, great, great story. And so with the, with Zen club, um, so as you said, you started off with this WordPress site, um, and the idea of like doing these video consultations, have you now developed beyond the WordPress site, uh, as your co-founder <laughs> created that you, you know, is it a SaaS platform, um, as such? Yeah. So, so what were our initial, um, guesses, right? Like we, we didn't want, we wanted to be B2C to start off because we wanted to be dependent of all the stakeholders that are very slow to move. So I don't want to be dependent on health plans. I don't want to be dependent on, on uh, hospitals, right? Because it's very long periods of negotiation, really risk averse. Like if, if the FinTech world is now like thinking of blockchains and whatnot, the, the medical world is still going from paper to the cloud, right? So we knew it, it was a big leap of, of faith. Second, we weren't fully regulated. So like the, the, the mental health committees here in Brazil had pre-regulated, so they said, okay, online orientation is allowed, but there's a cap on the number of sessions, you can't reimburse it. Uh, so there, was a lot, there were a lot of restrictions because they wanted to start testing it. And, and it makes sense, like you need to test things, but uh, so we didn't want to go through that route. So what was our alternative? Like we need to lower the cost of sessions as much as possible so that a person will pay for it, right? 
So I'm going to give the numbers in dollars just to make it easier, okay? So an average session, 50-minute um, session with a therapist or coach costs around $60, $70. We don't know today because the, mm -hmm. the, the markets are, are crashing, right? But around that, and, and that's very expensive it's because usually a person does four a month, yeah, one every week. So we're talking about $250 over to $300 a month. That's like the, the average wage <laughs> in Brazil. So what mm -hmm. we decided to do was a SaaS platform for professionals. So we did like, here's a tool where you have a website, just that's the LinkedIn. Um, you have a booking system, payment system, video session system, and also a reminder. So, and you can manage all your, your clients here. And it's for free. And we'll only charge um, a commission, a fee, um, on the clients we bring you. And if you bring clients of your own, we won't charge you a thing because we wanted to get the liquidity going. We wanted mm -hmm. them to move their, their patients over from Skype and over also from the physical world over to the online world, right? Uh, so we were taking off of them, like all the administrative uh, roles, right? We were giving them a marketing platform, right? We were giving them reach from, from in, in 24 hours, they were exposed professionally, you know, on a Google indexed website uh, to the world, right? Uh, and we were taking them their, their cost, their fixed cost structure. So if he, if he was charging $60 for a session offline, if I take, if I take his office, the, the, the time traveled, the distance they, like the, the time lost, uh, they, they gave us a uh, 60% discount. So they were like, okay, I can, I, I can see this as a place where I'm going to give you my, my non-useful slots and let's see what's the traction builds, right? And so that was a very interesting promise for the specialists. We were, we always had a very, like, we need to vet. So it's not about quality, it's not about quantity of specialists, it's about quantity of slots. So we want the least number of specialists, but the maximum number of slots out of those guys, right? Um, and then we focused on how do I get demand so they are motivated uh, with us. Um, and that's how we started. So uh, we started then looking at, at clients and it was a lot about Facebook groups. It was a lot about influencer marketing and a lot about Google ads to, to kick it off. Are you, are you operating or is, is the market that you're serving just Brazil? Is it Latin America or are you global? So we're Brazil, but you've got to keep into account there's 6 million Brazilians live, living abroad. So 20% mm -hmm. of our clients live in 70 countries spread out throughout the world, um, which is great because for them, they usually live Brazil because of a better opportunity uh, because Brazil is a developing market, right? Uh, uh, the, usually Brazilians that live abroad, they're in the developed world. So they, they are, they, their salaries in dollars, pounds, euros. And so they have, they have a lot of bar bargaining power. Um, and they don't have anywhere to go, right? Like uh, the, cultural, the cultural fit is very important. A view with the th therapist, right? Uh, the language is very important. And so they look at us as, as, as like one of the only places where they could, they, they could go. Over the last couple of years, I've certainly I've noticed uh, in Europe, um, obviously where you know I'm I, I'm in London, but in Europe, mental health in the workplace, mental health at startups has become a very important topic, and it and it and it is written about um, you know quite a lot. Uh, I believe there are new products and services out there as well uh, to to help around that. Um, how is it in Latin America? Because you obviously would have a good uh, point of view from that. Is it an important topic? In the workplace in Latin America, you know, what are startups, uh, you know, doing? What are you seeing uh, around this topic? Sure. So a little bit of uh, numbers. Brazil is the most anxious country in the world, according to the International Stress Association. It's like the fifth most depressed. So we're talking about like a country with probably 30 to 50 million people with mental health issues. Um, but only... I, I can honestly say like 2016, 2017 were years where we were like really devoted to our vision that this was a big problem. This wasn't a niche problem. Pre people weren't problem aware, but the problem was there. 
right? Uh, and in 2018, everything changed for us because um, there was a lot of research coming out. Even like if you look, Brazil is, is a country, is a very digital country, and it's a country where uh, people are very impacted by celebrities. So they start looking at Lady Gaga talk and Selena Gomez, the royal family talking in, in the UK, right? And, and, and it builds up, it's a compound effect. So in 2018, second semester of 2018, the mental health committee regulated the online space. So you're not orientation, you're, you're full. Like offline and online sessions have the same clinical efficacy. And that meant two things. One, uh, therapists and coaches wouldn't look at us as a threat, but as a partner. And so that the word, so you start having less detractors right? Because you would go to a person that's already going to a therapist and asks, asks about online sessions and the therapist is like, oh, I don't believe in that. That's not regulated. That's not proven. That's shit, right? And with that, they didn't have that argument. So again, you open up that market to talk about more about the topic. And second, and, and bringing that workplace um, angle you just brought, when you were negotiating with companies, you wouldn't go to the purchase uh, purchase department or the legal department and, and they would be like, okay, this is not regulated. We can't offer this to our employees. So 20, that's, that's end of 2018 and 2019, we really start working with companies. Now that's our main focus. Um, and I would say startups is where the problem or the, the, this, this, this pool is, is most, uh, is, is more important because it's, it's a much, it's, it's a millennial topic. If, if you look at our society, right, uh, if I talk with my dad, my dad was like, what are you doing? Like, you're quitting medicine to focus on mental health? Like, how, how weak can you be, right? <laughs> what, what are, even with my mom in that situation, right? Uh, if you talk about millennials, they're much more about living a purposeful life, like values. Um, and, and, and it's an interesting thing. Like, they're much more self-aware than probably our parents but they don't know what to do with that self-awareness. That's why you have FOMO, fear of missing out. Okay, uh, I'm very aware, but what do I do? Uh, and so in startups, you can see like a uh, very dynamic environment, uh, very aggressive objectives. 90% um, of the population is millennial. And, and you just see like, I need to do something. I need to bring in uh, tools to, to promote resilience, focus, uh, anxiety and control, uh, people are also getting promoted very quickly from a technical standpoint onto a managerial uh, role, right? They, they never dealt with people. Uh, and so we see that we, uh, our value proposition is, is very in, in contact with scaling HR, scaling culture, right? And, and allowing leaders and companies to focus on what's professional, right? But having a 24 hours uh, like omnipresent partner uh, present so that their employees can reach out and really develop themselves, right? So let, let's look at that then from the uh, mental health, uh, you know, from a founder perspective and then the, the employees. So mm -hmm. how important for, for founders to, uh, to, you know, take mental health seriously, to look after their own mental health? And what is it that they should be doing? Um, you know, what sort of practices? So wel welcome your advice on that. And then, let, let, then let's kind of flip it to the employees. Sure. Um, so it's super important for both, right? We're all humans. But I, I do think that founders don't take it as seriously as they might <laughs> take. Uh, I think when you start a company, you, you're a very determined person. You're very resilient. You think you can, you can own it, right, on yourself. Um, and, and so uh, let's, let's look at it in two different perspectives. One, the mental health of a founder obviously impacts the, the workplace environment, the culture, right? Um, so it's super important that you take care of it. I do see, I do look at the spectrum, right, of mental health from mental illness, mental well-being, and then mental performance, right? I do think founders tend to invest a lot on mental performance, so coaching, right? really getting that like focus, working, sleeping six hours, waking up early, going be to bed late. Um, but, and they do need a traumatic event, either in the company, in their, in their social sphere, 
or within themselves to really look at the situation and say, I'm not very self-aware. Like, I need to be my best self. My best self is not working 15 hours straight for seven days in a row, right? Um, but I, I, you, you tend to see it after a traumatic event. That's my view on the way I talk to founders. Um, and, and usually it's after like a burnout, it's after like an anxiety crisis. Um, but I, I do tend to think that, and, I, and we do see with dialogue opening up, I think vulnerability starts being looked up as a strength and not as a weakness. And that, that gives like opening for founders also to not own it all, not know it all, and really like, like uh, let their team, team players, right? Uh, come up with solutions as well and, and, and strive on the business. Um, if we look at it from the employee's perspective, right, uh, I think they love it. I think they love um, a company, again, going back to values, virtues, um, uh, purpose, right? I think they love the fact that, okay, I know I'm in a dynamic place. I know like we need to give everything we have, but they're also investing in us. Like they're, they're giving me the tools to develop quickly. So I think that coaching and therapy are, are tools that help you go from A to B much quicker, right? Because uh, usually you leave uh, university and you depend a lot on, on bosses, right? To, to evolve, right? To develop yourself into an adult. And in startups, usually you're a, your own boss, right? And, and to have specialists that can either help you on a social sphere, professional sphere, love sphere, like, and you develop into an adult and really into a self-aware person, it's great. And, and that's what we see um, in the companies we work with. Um, so we're looking at uh, SaaS startups. I mean, you, you work with a, a, a lot of SaaS companies, right? Um, mm -hmm. And to see what, uh, and obviously we, we have a, an audience of, uh, you know, SaaS, SaaS companies SaaS. listening to, to this podcast, right? Um, what could they be doing? What could the founders be doing? What can the companies be doing now? If they're not already doing something around this space, you know, what can they start to implement, uh, assuming that they have nothing in place, you, you know, around uh, mental health and well-being for the, for the company? Sure. Um, I think it's, 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 it's a tripod. So it's a, a three approach. Uh, um, it's it's a, 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 a tripod, right? So it's top-down encouragement. So leadership really encouraging, uh, opening up space for people to, to pursue uh, help if they need, right? And not weakening them or, or looking at them uh, from a weak perspective. Uh, third is reaching frequency. So opening up round tables on the one-on-one -on -one that you have, not only focusing on the numbers, focusing on the people. I know this might seem like, oh, here's the doctor speaking about people, but I need to give my, my investors the, the end result at the end of the month. But honestly, if you have people uh, very well, like uh, in, a good, in a good mental state of mind, right? Um, they're gonna perform better. They're gonna communicate better inside and outside of the company. It's gonna be much more pleasurous to work with them, right? And it, it, it comes naturally. So it's top-down approach, right? Opening up, round tables, uh, feedback, uh, and opening up the topic. And then having a service like Zen Club, for instance, that really allows you to scale the part of, of treatment and sessions. Like, so it's 24 sevens availability. Uh, they can do it from their office or home. Like you don't have any operational hassle to, to make it happen, right? And, and, and you see the, the benefits. Like in Brazil, we work with around 70 startups now. So starting last year. Um, and we have a 20% monthly engagement. So that's a lot. Like you definitely see that having that safe space for people either to go like, oh my God, I'm feeling anxious. Oh, I have fear of talking in public and I'm a salesperson and I need to develop that, you know, and not trying to develop that on, 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 on their own. Like it's, it's amazing and we're really seeing the benefits of it. We see productivity. So we do a lot of research within that pool of companies we work with and we see productivity increase. So the last research we did was on a thousand employees. 85% um, of them said their, employee, uh, their productivity increases due to Zen Club and 40 of them said, said that it increases in 40%. What's 40%? They said 
okay, on a monthly, um, on a monthly basis, uh, if I use M Club weekly, I believe uh, my productivity increases in a day. So that's, that's a 10% increase. And it makes sense. Like you wake up in the morning, you open up your computer, you have your breakfast, talk to your therapist. Imagine getting to work on that day. Your, your morning is going to be productive. You know, like you're going to be wired up. It's like going to the gym, right? You, people go to the gym in the morning, they're wired up when they get to work. Same thing here. So you see productivity increase, you see engagement. So one of the things we see in, um, in startup worlds is really emotional intelligence. It's how people communicate with, it's the empathy people have. And so you do see um, workplace uh, conflicts decreasing as well. And then you see employer branding. It's a great tool for hiring. Like, and, and those companies that we work with have been using Zen Club as a flagship for like, like it's, it's like diversity, right? You, companies started really looking into sustainability because of climate change. Then diversity came into as a big focus. We need to have more women. We need to have more LGBTQ in leadership positions. And now the, 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 third, the third sphere is mental health. And so employer branding is also... Uh, promoted uh, by you posting out like I do care about you there's gonna be pressure but let's do it together and let's develop together thanks for being on the uh, on, on the show who we brand out CEO and founder of Zen Club thank you so much Alex mm -hmm.